Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Thank you, Lisa, wherever you move to, here you are. Thank you for your prayers. Um, even though we only come back every two or three years, every time we pull into the parking lot across the, from the church, we always say, if God ever calls us back to move back and live here to Canada, this would become our home church. So thank you for being such a welcoming and friendly congregation. It's always a joy to um, open God's word together and see what the Spirit has for this church this morning. The story from this morning comes from my part of the land, um, the story from Exodus chapter 1. I'll read it, and if you have a Bible, please turn to page 55 in your pew Bible. Exodus chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Essachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, who didn't know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the first trick to deal with this problem was that they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. The trick didn't work. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. Second trick, they made their lives bitter. In another translation, they embittered their souls. With hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields, in all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, that's the third trick, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it's a boy, kill him, but if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. The third trick didn't work. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God 
was kind to the midwives. And the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave his order to all his people with the fourth trick. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. This is the word of the Lord. The two women, Shifra and Pua, went to bed that night hoping for a quiet night. That's the kind of thing you hope for when you work as midwives. And it was a quiet night, but the morning wasn't so quiet. A loud knock on the door, a harsh voice behind the door, not the usual voice of a woman who's coming to call them because a delivery is happening, or the voice of a little boy who's coming to show them the way to where the delivery is. This time it was the voice of a strong man, one of Pharaoh's soldiers. They quickly cover their head, they run to the door, and Pharaoh's soldier says to them, the Pharaoh wants to see you immediately. The Russian put on their best attire, fit for a king. They show up at the palace. Pharaoh looks quite upset. Everyone in Egypt knows that there's been rising tensions between the Egyptians and the Hebrews and that Pharaoh's patience was running short. Pharaoh starts speaking to them in a voice that sounded more desperate than demanding. I am tired of these Hebrews. They keep growing and multiplying and increasing in numbers, and I'm afraid for our country. Do you understand what threat they are? Even though there's no mention that the Hebrews were any threat. But that's what unreasonable fear does to leaders. You now need to help me, Chef Rampois. I've tried to deal with this problem. I've ordered all my slave masters to work them ruthlessly, to use them and abuse them, to oppress them to make them work so hard that they're physically exhausted when they go home. And yet, these Hebrew men still have enough energy to go home and have babies. I've even ordered them to embitter their souls, to break their spirits, so that even if they had the physical energy, they wouldn't have the desire. And yet, these Hebrew men still go home and have babies. So I'm done trying to fix this problem by dealing with the men. I now need to deal with the women. I need you. I order you. I, Pharaoh, command you. That every time you deliver one of these Hebrew women, if it's a boy, you kill them. If it's a girl, let them live. Girls don't fight in armies. Shefra and Pua stood there, shocked that Pharaoh would ask them 
to kill lives when they've dedicated their entire lives to give life. But they didn't dare say anything because who dares talk back to Pharaoh, the highest authority, not just in Egypt, but in the entire land at that time. They bowed their heads and walked backwards out of Pharaoh's presence, out of the palace, and they looked at each other and they thought, what are we going to do? But that question and that fear lasted but moments. Because there was a bigger fear that overwhelmed them. The Bible calls it the fear of the Lord. They feared God more than they feared those who can kill the body. So they went home and devised some form of a plan. It must have been a very creative plan. Because 80 years later, when we read about the numbers that came out of Egypt in the book of Numbers, the first chapter, we're told that 603,000 men, ages 20 and above, left Egypt. More than half a million boys lived to be men and have children and the next generation and the next generation that 80 years later, more than half a million young men ages 20 and above left Egypt liberated to go and worship God. What kind of plan did they come up with? Not only did they have to come up with the plan and execute the plan, they had to train others to do the same plan. Ben Azra is an ancient commentator who said that by looking at the numbers of the Hebrews in Egypt then and the Egyptians, there is no way that those were the only two midwives doing this work. Ben Azra estimates that there was 500 midwives at that time. Shifra and Pua were the head midwives. That's why Pharaoh called them. How did they inspire 500 other midwives to fear God more than Pharaoh? How did they do it? What did they create? An insulated chamber to put the mother in or to put the baby in as soon as the baby's born to make sure that nobody hears the cry, the screams of the delivering mother and the cry of the born baby? How did they do it? Where did they get the creativity, the means, the courage? I wonder, if the mother of Moses was not herself inspired by their courage, when after three months she couldn't hide Moses in her home anymore and she had to come up with this invention of a basket, I wonder, how did they do it? Any of you who've been around newborn babies, you know how hard it is to keep a newborn from crying? In fact, an essential part of a midwife's job is to make sure that the newborn cries. Because that's the only way they can guarantee that the lungs are actually working. 
And it's that first beautiful cry of the newborn that replaces the mother's anguished screams. It's that first beautiful cry that tells us, baby's healthy, baby will live. It's not a coincidence that these two ladies are named Shifra and Pua. Pua in Hebrew means beautiful. Shifra means lips or cry. Shifra and Pua delivered the beautiful cry of the Hebrews at birth before Moses, 80 years later, delivered them from the land to the wilderness. How did they do it? How creative were they to make sure that the Egyptian neighbors who got the same instructions from Pharaoh did not hear the beautiful cries of all these Hebrew boys born home after home, night after night for 80 years. But one day, somebody heard and somebody went and reported to Pharaoh. There are Hebrew boys running around. Something is not right with this picture. And another knock on the door and another harsh voice behind the door. They open the door, heads covered. And the soldier says, Pharaoh wants to see you immediately. This time they don't rush to put on their best attire to be fit for the king. This time they rush to give their final hugs, the final goodbyes. Because everybody in Egypt knew what happens to people who disobey Pharaoh. It's an act of treason. They come into Pharaoh's presence and Pharaoh is a hundred times more angry than they saw him last time. And the interrogation begins. What have you done? Why have you let the boys live? They look at each other. And one of them delivers the speech that I imagine they practiced over and over and over after every delivery, anticipating this dreadful moment. She says, Your Majesty, Hebrew women are vigorous. They're not like Egyptian women. They deliver before we even get to them. Now, as an Egyptian woman, woman who's experienced four childbirths myself, I would tell you that this is a blatant lie. <laughs> and yet, God doesn't condemn it. His ways are far from our ways. He still had a purpose yet to be accomplished through these two women, Shifra and Pua. And so a flood of dumbness falls on Pharaoh and he believes the lie. And he lets them go. And they walk out of his presence unharmed because a flood of kindness falls on Shifra and Pua. The Bible gives no explanation for how these two women survived this interrogation 
except that God was kind to them. That's it. That's it. They feared God and God was kind to them. Years later, Moses would write about this and he'd say, God honors those who honor him. How? We don't understand. In ways we can't even imagine. If we think they were creative in saving the lives of all these boys, God is much, much more creative in how he shows kindness to us. Even if it comes to dumbing down the highest authority in the land, just to protect us. Eighty years later, more than half a million men go out to worship God because of the courage and creativity of two women who feared God more than Pharaoh. Because of two women who decided to make an impact in their circle of influence. So I ask you today, what is your circle of influence? Where has God called you to make an impact courageously, creatively, simply because you fear God? What is your circle of influence. In physics, we learn that if I occupy this space, no one else can come and occupy this space. So it is in the spiritual realm. When God has placed you in a certain place, in a certain circle of influence, no one else can come and take that place. This is your space. What is your circle of influence? Where is God calling you uniquely to impact that circle of influence? Who are the people that you can touch that none of us in this room can touch? What are the conversations that are designed for you before God established this earth and not for anyone else? Shifra and Pua knew their place, knew their calling, knew their God. Do you know your place? your calling, and your God. One of the main doctrines of the Reformed Church, one of the things that we hold onto as Protestants and Reformed, is a doctrine called the priesthood of all believers. Is a doctrine that says that all of us are royal priests unto God. Is a doctrine that sees that what happened on Good Friday when the curtain of the temple was torn in two, that when Jesus entered the Holy of Holies, he didn't just give us access, all of us to the Holy of Holies, but he also released the Holy of Holies to come out into every square inch of our world. So that every part of our lives, God looks over and Jesus calls, this is mine. Those are the words of Abraham Kuyper, the Dutch theologian. The Holy of Holies have come out to every sphere of influence, to every circle of impact. And so we 
carry that holy of holies within us. We have now become the temple of God and we have become priests unto God, not in the order of Aaron in the book of Exodus, but in the order of Jesus Christ, our high priest. We're the temple of God and we are the priests of God carrying the holiness and presence and life and beautiful cry of life into every sphere of influence. And so we teach people that whatever it is that you do, do it with all your heart as serving the Lord. When you enter a classroom or you enter a lab, do it as one serving the Lord. When you clear a pipe, when you remove cancer cells, do it as one serving the Lord. When you raise children and when you teach leaders, do it as one serving the Lord. When you bring a meal to a neighbor, when you visit the sick in the hospital, when you stand by somebody who's grieving, when you counsel somebody who's confused, do it as one serving the Lord. When you play the piano, when you paint a canvas, when you clean the street, when you plant the tree, do it as one serving the Lord. Where has God called you to be a priest in your circle? Which people? Which neighborhood, which nation is waiting for a beautiful cry to be released so that more people would be inspired by our courage, our creativity, our fear of God. Shifran Pua feared God and were a beautiful cry for the people of God. Who are you called to be a Shifra and Pua to, to bring a beautiful cry in your sphere of influence? Will you pray with me, please? Lord God, we thank you We thank you that you trust us with so much more than we're capable of. You do it because you want us on our knees, humbly calling for the help of the Holy Spirit, relying on you and not on humans, not on our abilities, not on our gifts, not on our strengths, not on our intelligences. You call us to a task impossible for us, but possible with you. You call us to give life and future to people, eternal future but the threats of pharaohs in our lives are real. Fear holds us back. Lord, forgive us. Would you release us from our fear of every pharaoh in our lives, of every unreasonable threat and fear? Would you give us the courage to obey and to follow you risking our lives to see others live. For those of us that you call to stay in our place, give us the courage to love our families and our neighbors and our co-workers and our peers and our friends with the fear of the Lord. And for those of us that you're calling to be sent out, to leave our circle of comfort, to enter into a new circle of influence, 
Would you give us the courage to follow you where we do not know? To step into the darkness with the power of your light? Would you make us a beautiful cry for this generation? In your name we pray. Amen.